Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo. We are here every single Thursday at 1130. And this week we're in for a real treat because we've got a special guest coming on today, uh, Jet Durham, who is a guitarist um, and a keyboard player. He specifically asked me to say guitars first. So um, he's coming on. He's sharing some awesome stuff. Um, this guy has done some amazing things with um, OSC and scripting, but I think it's still accessible enough uh, for those of you who are just playing guitar for cover bands or you're doing something that is relatively simple to really glean a lot of information from. Um, he also happens to be just as into productivity applications as I am, which is a pretty rare thing. Um, anyway, if you are here with us right now, um, go ahead and say hello in the comments. We've got our regular attenders popping in. Impulse Music, so happy to have you here. Welcome, Thomas. So glad that you're here today, Glenn. Uh, welcome. I've been going through some of the comments from last week's live stream with Amos Def, and uh, it turns out there are actually a lot of organ players who started on organ and then ended up um, as keyboardists, which this is new information to me. So um, thank you guys so much, even for those of you who are watching later after these streams uh, end. You can join us live. We see your comments. We hear you. Um, and we're super grateful for the community around this program. Um, so yeah, thanks for being with us. We're going to jump in here. Um, Jeff's going to so show us through, uh, what he's doing. Um, and I want to encourage you as well. If you have any questions about what you're seeing, don't hesitate to just pop it in the comments. We want to support you guys. Um, and it's definitely not just, um, you know, about checking out what he's doing. It's really about inspiring the greater, uh, progress of the viewers and, and, uh, you know, bringing some some insight and knowledge to what's possible. Um, all right, so we're going to bring on Jet. Here he is. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Jet? how's it going, everybody? Dude, thank you so much for coming on. Um, really happy to have you here. So yeah. uh, for those who don't know you, I we, we've talked a couple of times yeah, here. Everybody. I'm like, I get it now. Um, <laughs> for those who have no idea what you're doing, can you just give us like a general <laughs> overview? Who are you? What do you do? How'd you end up on Gig Performer and all that stuff? Okay, well, it all started about 30 years ago. No, well, longer than that now. Uh, <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. Right, right. So anyway, my name's Jet. <laughs> I, uh, I play, I've been uh, pretty much a lifelong musician. Um, yep. You know, picked up guitar in, in around middle school, high school, <clears throat> almost 20 years ago now. Uh, actually, yep. Yeah, yep. about 20 years ago now. Crazy um, up. See the goes, gray in the hair starting to come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, discovered guys like uh, Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, um, and then uh, my world opened up when I discovered Dream Theater. Um, mm. That's when I started like taking up keyboard and singing and everything like that. Yeah. And then um, somehow um, I, I'm from Wichita, Kansas, which doesn't have um, any any sort of progressive music scene, but um, yeah. uh, we you know had had at least about ten years ago a strong uh, local rock scene. So I ended up playing in a mm -hmm. couple of uh, local metal bands, uh, rock bands. Um, one of them ended up um, trying to kind of make it, you know, about 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then that band was the first time that I started playing guitar. I was playing uh, guitar and keyboards, um, mm. you know, professionally, so to speak, on stage. Yeah, yep. So um, I'm also a, a software developer by trade. I uh, work on web applications, um, front-end JavaScript, uh, that whole mm. messy world for anybody who knows. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so yeah, I was kind of an early adopter to, um, to sort of VST technology using it live. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, it's been around for a while for, you know, DAWs, digital, uh, digital audio workstations, recording and that kind of stuff. But like the idea of using computers live, um, I, I know still some, some people still have uh, trepidation with it, but, yeah. uh, I was yeah. just kind of an early adopter, you know, laptops were getting smaller about 10, 12 years ago. Um, very powerful still. You don't really need a ton of power to run. Uh, most VSTs at least 10 years ago. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know, I was able to, um, w what it really was driven by was just sort of uh, a couple of ideas, um, an idea of modularity so that I can have my controllers all independent and separate and then just wire them together with MIDI or USB. Um, mm -hmm. All of my sounds, my I can program them ahead of time, uh, save them to a file, back them up. You know, mm -hmm. these things are possible with like workstations, but, um, you know, you know, for me, it's uh, part of it. Also, was cost. You know, big workstations mm -hmm. are expensive, especially when you start getting into the business of having backups. So, <laughs> mm. um, did you have a, a particular piece of 
hardware that made you wish everything was in your computer? Like, was there a moment you hit the friction of like, this needs to be modular? <laughs> right. Um, well, so back then I was still running all my guitar sounds uh, through hardware uh, of some sort. So I started off. I started off on modeling technology actually with like the Boss GT8 about 20 okay. years ago. Um, okay. So floor modelers, and then um, at the behest of some of my bandmates, when we were trying to make it, you know, they were mm -hmm. like, "Oh, you got to have real guitar amps and whatever." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." So <laughs> so I built this huge rig, you know, uh, eight space mm -hmm. rack, uh, full on, you know, 100 watt tube amp uh, with the uh, four by 12 cabinet. Um, so yes. all my guitar, all my guitar hardware was separate like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I still used the, the laptop for all of my keyboard sounds just because um, it was flexible at the time. Um, and when I was searching for a solution there, I stumbled upon Brainspawn Forte, which okay. um, that was through actually the keyboard player from Marillion, I, uh, Mark Kelly. I saw an article that he did uh, where gotcha. he was talking about this like custom rack built computer that he had, you know, <clears throat> and little monitors and a couple different parts of his rig to, to see the, the scenes changing and whatnot. And I was like, okay, that's because mm -hmm. like, I was very inspired by. Uh, Seeing Jordan Rudis play live from Dream Theater, yeah, he's got, yep. you know, he just basically like steps through the show, like press a right. button and then like his whole keyboard sound changes. Like, okay, that's what I want. Yeah, I've always had, uh, I've always had very little appetite for tap dancing, you know, with, right. with large pedal boards and whatnot. So that's kind of what drew me yeah. to floor modelers with the guitar and then through the keyboard, same idea. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So with with the like giant cabinets and everything, like. Do you miss them at all, or are you happy to not have to deal with them? No. <laughs> I yeah. do not miss them. Um, <laughs> okay, fair. Well, so, I mean, modeling, you know, about about that time is when uh, the fractal axe effects uh, started hitting the market and started getting wide adoption. And, yeah. um, I mean, that, that kind of changed the game, you know. I think it made modeling, I mean, you know, pods, you know, Line 6 pod and Boss equipment's yep. been around for, have been around for a while. Uh, I actually used some modelers from like early '90s or the '80s or at some point, and like mm -hmm. it's, it's okay, you know, like it, for yeah. a live situation. Like, I mean, everything's trade offs at this point, right? Like, right, sure. Um, and I'd probably be fine with that trade off, you know, in the '80s or mm -hmm. so. But uh, right. I mean, now there's almost no trade off in terms of quality of the guitar sounds because yeah, the the hardware uh, the, the the hardware modelers are really good, and most of them have a a corresponding you know VST plugin that you can just drop in a DAW or or Gig Performer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, this is uh, this is we didn't prep for this question, but I'm just no. curious. Did you have a high school band? Like, did you play in high school or no? Uh, I I played in the in the high school band. I played flute. Gotcha. Actually, was my uh, my introduction into music. There you um, go. There you go. But I didn't have like a garage band in, in high okay, school. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering. I was <laughs> like, you know. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, okay, so. That's that's a great overview. I didn't know you were on the front end of web developing. For some reason, I like pictured you like <laughs> designing. Anyway, that's uh, awesome. I I do a little bit of everything these days. Right, so. right, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's a necessary skill. Okay, right. so um, Jet, can you give us like the overview? Can I share your screen and then we'll like okay, yeah, show sure. us what you're doing? Are you? Did we miss anything leading up to uh, this? Well, yeah. We, I mean, we didn't really talk about like the gap I had in my music, and then getting into yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, so let's go over that too, because that is relevant with right. All this yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. um, because I, I think I understand that Brainspawn Forte is discontinued now. It uh, is. Which, is... which we had um, who came on recently, who also went from Forte to Gig Performer for similar reasons. Just right. he was like, well, it's not supported anymore. It doesn't anyway. Right. So, so you were using that. Go go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, so that band didn't make it. It turns out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, you know, it happens. <laughs> it's just really hard to get out of the Midwest. Everything's so spread apart. You know. Sure. Um, sure. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I took some time off basically to kind of get my career going, to get my family yeah. going. Um, got married. Got had dogs. Yeah. You know, all, all the good stuff. Uh, and then, you know, about five or six years ago now, uh, the drummer from my old band reached out to me kind of out of the blue. We remained friends, but mm -hmm. he reached out out of the blue and said, hey, you, you want to join a, a local metal cover band? And I was like, OK. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was settled in my, my career enough where I could dedicate the time. And uh, mm -hmm. so so from there, I was only playing guitar for the longest time. I was using um, an iPad app to do some uh, auxiliary sounds just because I get bored <laughs> just playing <Yeah>. guitar. <laughs> so, sure, sure, sure. Um, um, but then, and then I joined the classic rock band about a year ago. Um, okay. And then I was, I'd always had in the back of my mind, like when I discovered main stage, I, you know, mm -hmm. keep up on the mm -hmm. audio news, even though I wasn't really like doing anything with it. 
Uh, sure. I discovered main stage and I was like, okay, if I ever play keyboards live again, I'm going to use that, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so right. lo and behold, when I joined the classic rock band, they are have a guitar player. I'm like, okay, I can do guitar and keyboards. So, you know, easy, <laughs> right. easy win there. I've always liked being sort of the ox guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I fired up main stage and then from there, like it made sense. Okay. Like I have a, a floor modeler at the time for my guitar and, and then using main stage for my keyboards, it's like, you know, I could probably just spend a little bit of ex more extra money and time to like get everything uh, all together. You know, to get my guitar running through the computer as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and were you so were, was there a time where you were using main stage to process both? Yes. Yes, there was. Um, our first couple of shows, I was just using main stage, and it was uh, it was okay, uh, but I did find it lacking in, in a couple of ways. Like it was really hard to kind of have uh, separation between my guitar rig and my keyboard rig. Right. And I, I don't know. I've always kind of had this idea of like how things should be separate. Like my my brain works in a in a certain way, mm -hmm. and then like mm -hmm. having to map that into the, whatever software I'm using, you know, can be a challenge mm -hmm. sometimes because it doesn't support that. You know, it doesn't support having like two banks of songs or something like that. Unless you wanted to run right. two instances, but. I had some stability issues and bugs with the one instance, so I wasn't really confident in running, trying to run two instances of main stage with different rig files or whatever. Right. So, okay. This is like the little things where it's like when you need something to be 100% reliable, it's like the reliability, and maybe it shouldn't be this way, but it's like the reliability takes second class to your imagination. Right. So like you're yeah. you're like envisioning a world in which like you can run everything through your computer and you're like, but I also want to have two instances. I want it to, you know, whatever, do all of these things. Right. And then you're like, hmm, something's yeah. not working here. <laughs> yeah, uh, just too much friction, you know, and I, I think main stage has has some like well known bugs about like faders not moving when they should and it was just very not not very intuitive to like actually program everything I wanted to program so yes you know yes did you ever end up trying any of the scripting in main stage uh just a little bit it, it was hard okay, okay. it was it was not very didn't seem very accessible um okay. like doing okay. things like chord triggers and whatnot um it was just yeah it was i tried it but uh, i think they actually use javascript uh, for their language but um yeah yep. something <laughs> about it it just didn't really click like i, I didn't really see very many <laughs> applications where it could be practical i guess with sure with some of the other limitations that main stage had so yeah. So anyway, so this the the main stage happened after your break, right? So you took yeah. your break, then main stage happened. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then then where did we end up? Right. So I started looking for a solution. Um, like what else? What else is out there? What can I do? And I right. I had, I had yeah. stumbled upon Gig Performer at some point. I don't remember exactly how, but um, mm -hmm. you know, KVR forums or something like that, maybe. Sh sure. Yeah. Um, yep. But I was like, okay, maybe this is an answer. I remember seeing like the wiring, like the block wiring diagram screenshots, and I was like, that makes sense to me as a, as a guitar player, mm -hmm. even though right. I've always kind of approached right. my guitar sound building as more of a keyboard player than a guitar player, but whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, like, mm -hmm. so I downloaded the trial. I started um, just trying to put my guitar sounds together in here, and like a couple things just like immediately clicked. Um, the mm -hmm. biggest thing was the separation between your rack spaces and your variations and your songs mm -hmm. and song parts. Yes. Uh, Cause one challenge I always had with my hardware modelers was wanting to basically step through the show, like uh, have basically at one patch for every song, each of those patches could have different variations of sounds, clean, uh, heavy lead. Uh, but uh, what would happen sometimes is that uh, I like oh I'm not happy with my guitar amp anymore for some reason you know my ears have gotten tired of it and I want to change it. Um, the problem is in that world like you have to go through each one of those patches and effectively just I open it up in the editor on the computer and copy and paste um, the necessary blocks between different pages and it's like yeah that works but um, it's it's error prone it's time consuming like mm -hmm. what I would really like to have is just like a global amp or something for every song mm -hmm. um, or for the whole show. And then like map that to each of my patches or something. And uh, Gig right. Performer uh, is the perfect solution for that for me because I can have uh, just a couple of banks of different guitar sounds, uh, different variations, and then have my songs in the setlist view, have my songs and song parts mapped out to, uh, to just kind mm -hmm. of point to those instead of like being copies of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that totally ties in with your whole thought process on keeping things separate, right? Like yeah, having the ability... 
Yeah, to have mm-hmm. the separation, like you have a rack space, and you're like, well, I could use this rack space in six different songs if I wanted to. Yeah, exactly. right? I mean, it's the kind of the plug and play. It's it's brilliant. Okay, mm-hmm. so those are some of the things that clicked with you when you checked out Gig Performer. At this point, you're like still in the trial. Right. Yep. Um. And when do, when did shift happen? Were you did you... right? Uh, th- not very not very long. Uh, I, I <laughs> okay. I, I pulled my guitar stuff out of main stage uh, almost immediately because uh, okay. it it only took me you know, maybe a couple hours to kind of program everything. Once I kind of wrapped my head around mapping widgets to plugins yep. and parameters, and then songs and song mapping, like it it wasn't really that long of a process to get it going. So. Yes. So yeah, I mean, from there. So for a while there, I was running all my guitar sounds through, uh, ma- um, a gig performer. Sorry, what's the okay. name? What's the name of this thing we're doing again? Anyway. Yeah, we're we're, we're <laughs> which show are we on right now? <laughs> right, right. Gotcha. <laughs> and then all my all my keyboard sounds were still coming out of main stage, just because, um, uh, well, I'd yep. already done the work to program it all. Um, yep. didn't had a couple gigs coming up. Didn't really have the time to just tear it apart and rebuild it from the ground up. And then having mm-hmm. to go out and acquire a bunch of plugins that I didn't already have. Like main stage has all that stuff right. built in, but you can't just use it outside of main stage. So, mm-hmm, but I eventually mm-hmm. took the time. Like over the holidays, I had some time off and just spent like almost a week, you know, rebuilding all the keyboard patches too. And mm-hmm. um, I decided because I knew that it was a, a possibility to run two instances of Gig Performer, um, just because it had already been ah. working so well for me. Uh, running mm-hmm. Gig Performer next to main stage, I was like, well, why don't I just make a new rig file for all of my keyboard stuff and just keep that completely separate <clears throat> from all my guitar stuff? Like, if if I wanted to, I I probably could have like put all my guitar stuff into like the global rack space and and done some clever I don't know scripting or something to make it work. But sure. uh, you know, I I kind of have different guitar signal chains for the different bands I'm in. You know, the the metal cover mm-hmm. band wants really heavy, you know, distorted thick guitars and. The classic rock, um, there's a little bit of that, but not as much. You know, you kind of want a lighter Shh. sound. So sure, yeah. So, so anyway, that's where yep. I'm at now. I run <laughs> white noise. So, so sorry. This is just. I'm sure you're gonna answer this question, but I haven't actually asked you mm. this yet. So now I have like the the burning question. So, do you have a separate instance of your guitar for the two different bands, or do you keep everything in no, the same? No, no, no. I'm using like uh, for both bands. It's it's uh the guitar runs out of the same rig file, just different rack spaces and variations for the different bands. Gotcha. And then gotcha. um, same idea for the keyboards. And I'm, I'm not actually using song, songs and song parts in the keyboard instance. I'm just doing everything by rack space because <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, it, it mapped a little bit cleaner when I was coming over to main, from main stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it also, well, I, I'm going to spoil all of this, so I'm not going to say anything. But yeah, okay. it, it also makes sense with your overall setup, right? Like you don't necessarily need song parts in both instances. Right, right. And I know like yeah. um, uh, Thaddeus, who was on a couple weeks ago, uh, was yes. doing that between two instances. And that's, yes. it, it actually makes the scripting a little bit easier if you do it that way. Gotcha. Um, because you have to do something to kind of keep the two instances in sync. And so I'm using scripting for that. Um, right, right, right. So, okay, right. fair. So, yeah, I guess everybody's about to see this, but there's, <laughs> <Right>. it's <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's such a like well thought out setup that like it works just for you, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Because yeah. you built it just for you. Uh, yeah, um, effect- effectively, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's there's little parts that I've taken from the community, like the radio button idea. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, uh, and and the idea of uh, uh, the OSC hack uh, for like a, a global piano sound, so you only have to load up the sample once, uh, but you want to like transpose it per song. I saw a blog post that on on Gig Performer somewhere that where like you use OSC to. Uh, where you have the the key the the piano block in the global rack space, and then you're using OSC from rack spaces uh-huh. and variations, um, and that gives you the flexibility to transpose the piano per song or per rack space. Yes, David David wrote that blog, I think. Okay. Cool. Um. Anyway, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that was him. Da- da- David Twaving. Um. Sweet. Do you um? Do you, should we jump in? Should we? I, yeah, yeah. I we... think so. I think I've I think I've talked and, long enough. People want to and see this. And it, it's good. We got the overview. Okay, so I'm gonna share your screen. Okay, cool. Um, I'm pick up this thing. Here we go. Okay, cool. So we can see the two instances here. Yeah. Um, so I'm in uh, Rackspace view for or panels view for the guitar instance. This is kind of like the the, the main rig, the primary rig that has all the songs and song parts programmed in, um, but also does all mm-hmm. my guitar processing. Um, so, and I think that people should be able to hear. So, 
<laughs> anyway, this is my uh, my fast lane setup. Um, I, I do want to go through my hardware too at some point. Uh, yes. Quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to kind of yeah, give up. Whenever. Uh, yeah. Whenever it I, makes sense, go for it. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so I have basically you know two rack spaces for fast lane, uh, or one rack space for fast lane, one rack space for Gods of Wrath. Um, I'm loading it up here. This one, I have some performance issues I'm, I'm trying to track down. This is a lot of widgets going on in here. So, yes. Might be yeah. related to that. There's a lot of plugins. Um, I'm using a lot of plug. I'm like using three different copies of my guitar plugin to work around the latency issue. <laughs> but, okay. Well, you're uh, saying loading, right? It's the, lo the, the loading time. Is that what you, you mean? Of switching to the rack space. Yeah. There's a, yeah, a, tiny, gotcha. there's a tiny amount of latency too in um, switching variations. But so I'm on M1. Um, it's, you know, it's it's a the lowest spec yeah, MacBook sure. Air. It's it's still plenty fast for most things. So, um, yeah. you know, it I could be using the wrong plugin type. You know, audio unit sure, instead sure. of DST or something. Um, I don't know. I, I just need to like tear it down and rebuild it from the ground up. I just haven't had time sure. yet. <laughs> yeah, for but, sure. Yep. Um, right. So. So, anyway, so two completely separate signal chains for the two different bands. Mm hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the wiring view, I'll just do like a quick overview of this. I think this yeah. is probably, out, out of all the things I have in my setup, this is probably the least interesting. <laughs> okay, fair, <laughs> Like sure. what, what actual guitar effects I'm using. So, mm -hmm. um, so here's where the guitar gets split to the, to the three different amps, basically. Um, gotcha. But I'm running a, a Helix Native plugin in front just to kind of give me sort of a pedal board type of thing for, oh, I need to authorize Helix Native apparently. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't show that today. Um, yep. But that gives me things like, uh, and Helix Native was an obvious choice for me because uh, I was already using Helix hardware. So, mm -hmm. um, and this is the, uh, this top panel is where all the widgets there are mapped. So I'm running a couple pitch shifters for different kind of effects. Uh, mm -hmm. Wah, whammy. Um, I think it's my master guitar volume. Is there too, so so gotcha. this is my, my hardware uh, pedal board. I have an expression pedal just to move that. And it's mapped to three different parameters there. Because that was like the only way I could do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure, plugin, sure, sure. So. Um, okay, so sweet. For my actual guitar sound, I'm using the the Archetype Petrucci plugin. Um, so three different instances: one for clean, one for rhythm, and one for heavy, uh, or one for lead. Uh, and then you know just a couple of different parameters for those amps as well. So it's kind of broken out mm -hmm. here: clean amp, rhythm amp, lead amp. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't have to go into super deep detail there; otherwise, we we wouldn't get to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So one thing to mention too, if for and I guess this is helpful for you, but also for anybody who's watching, if if you're having like if you have a s super large amount of variations and you're finding that switching takes some time, if you break it out into separate rack spaces. It, it eliminates the latency completely. So anyway, yeah. there's pro pro tip while you're here. Um, right. Just, well, and um, yeah. will will snapshots fix that problem too? I don't know. Should I bring David on to answer that question? <laughs> Are you there? You yeah. yeah see. How's it how's it going, David? I'm I've been enjoying this. Um, <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, I love it. Yeah, good to good to meet you. Likewise. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, all the reasons you're bringing up are why I gave up on main stage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. if done what I needed. We wouldn't have bothered to invent this. Right. And yes, I refuse to use JavaScript. <laughs> I don't blame you. It's very polarizing. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if we had a better option on the web, uh, we would probably use it. <laughs> web, web assembly will save us someday. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Or not, or not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I yeah. Uh, David this, loves web design. It's his favorite. I, I am useless at it. I'm desperate for people who can do web design. Well, <laughs> my ability to do graphics. Well, let me put it this way. I am very good at drawing crooked lines with a ruler. No. <laughs> I'm serious. I can't. You know, uh, I, my drawing skills and my visual. <laughs> Abilities with color and stuff are terrible. Not you do not want me designing yeah. your GUI. Right, right. That's <laughs> that's that's what my wife that's what my wife does. Uh, or one there of her skill go. sets is graphic design. So I leave I leave all that to her. All well, the interior well, decorating. Anyway, <laughs> what was the question again? So, okay, so we're talking about how Gig Performer divides resources. 
So you were saying like if things were in rack spaces rather than variation, then switching would would create no latency. Yeah, well, switching when you, when you do it that way, I mean, you can you can be playing a chord and continue moving and, and <coughs> switch right in the middle of playing it, and it'll just keep going. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know? mm -hmm. uh, you can play a power chord, uh, uh, you know, on a guitar, a switch, and it's just instantly playing the new sound. There's no delay. Right. Um, so but it's, the fatal is you have to have another rack space. Right. It's so, so, uh, and you know, for people coming from Forte, which I never used, I, I mm. heard, of it, but it didn't oh, really it's been a long time for me. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, I was just saying it's been a long time for me. I, I don't know that I'll be able to provide any specifics. Well, no, no, no. But but the the model was just I think you had all your plugins and then you could turn them on and off. Oh, you're right. And bypass them, but you didn't have this notion where we can just do this instant switching. From one topology to a completely different one sure. on the fly, and that yeah. buys you a lot of benefit, um, you know. But the variations was intended really as a as a more general version of what Mainstage did with aliases. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes that, sense. That's where I was coming from. You know, you could have an alias, but that only let you control, I think, volume and pan. Maybe you couldn't. And I wanted just to be able to control anything you wanted and still be able to switch quickly, and that was. The idea behind variations. I mean, so, so, what was your question again? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. So, so if I were, so a lot of these variations are from a time before I realized that snapshots were a thing, like uh, per song snapshots. Yes. So you're saying that if I just cut out most of these variations, which I can because they're just song specific, um, then my performance problem will be better. Well, yeah. Okay. If you create <laughs> multiple rack spaces where uh, and where your different sounds, uh, you you know, you can just and then your song parts, as you switch, you just go to a, as you switch song parts, you just go to another rack space. Right. That will be instant. Okay. Mm. The downside is, of course, you have to create. Now, of course, what you could do, you know, you duplicate the rack space. So you have all the same plugins, and then you make the changes you want if that's what you're doing. Right. Um, you know, the downside is, of course, you're you're using up more resources. Right. It can still be handled because you can use predictive loading to save resources if you're tight, but <clears throat> you know, like everything else, there are trade-offs. Both have yeah. both have benefits. Um, the snap, yeah, the snapshot is on top of variations, right? Right, and you know, so that's a little bit different. I mean, that that's just a way. Uh, if you have, if you if you're reusing a rack space that has, say, a single variation in lots of different song parts, right. you can have different variations, even though it's the same underlying mm -hmm. rack space variation pair. Yeah, so like a lot of my variations are just for a particular effect. I don't know. Um, yeah, my Helix thing isn't working uh, because I need to authorize it. But um, it's like that's yeah. just like this is one pitch shift, and then this this adds in the next pitch shift, for example, or or changes the pitch shift parameters. I think. Yeah. Right. So I feel like that could be handled, with, but it's only used for one song part. So I could probably handle that with a variation or a snapshot instead. Well, yeah. If, well, yes. If you use snapshots and you just keep, leave, you just keep the single variation. It saves you having to create lots of rack space variations. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That that's that's the big benefit of uh, using song parts and snapshots. By the way, mm -hmm. one thing I started doing, and this might be a useful tip for everyone, um, you know, when you create a snapshot, uh, I often want to push it back to the rack space, uh, which you can do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can save and then there's a, there's a you can double the, the three dots the, you'll see if you go to the three dots over in the left yeah there there's a thing where you can say push song changes back to rack space okay and that it's to, it, yeah you have to have a you have to have a snapshot for that to be oh, okay able. um and i often do that because i often have a one-to-one -one rack space um with song parts for various reasons and what I've started doing with system actions in my global rack space, I have a button that does that um, push that snapshot back, which I can, Absolutely. which just saves me having to pop up that menu. I can just like push the button on a MIDI controller and it saves, saves the snapshot. Um, yes, and that's, that's by default, David. System actions has that available for everybody. Uh, in 4.5. Yep. Okay. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Four point five. That's at it. I've got that. Yeah. There's stuff for capturing, pushing back. Uh, uh, yeah. It's very handy. Super cool. Awesome. Sweet. Well, <laughs> thank you cool. for talking about variations. I appreciate you shining some light.
Yeah, right. yeah, that, that's very helpful. I'll have to yeah, it's, spend some it's time funny with that. when we do these, I'm like, you never actually know what type of ridiculous insight you're going to get. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. Yeah, you were so, talking about, where were we? You were showing... Well, we were going through uh, signal chains. Um, gotcha, so I, was, I showed you my God's Wrath rack space, which is huge yep. and needs to be trimmed yep. down, apparently. Yep. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I'm using uh, one rack space for fast lane, too, though. Actually, I am using another rack space that I switched to for clean sounds. And this... This is uh, this is instant. This is uh, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. so it's not getting through right. But mm -hmm. um, uh, so this is just a couple different variations of the sound. So anyway, that's a uh, mm -hmm. similar kind of deal here. Uh, some front effects with the Helix Native, Archetype Pachucci, a couple other effects afterward. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's all you know controlled by variations. So I, what I really want to dig into though is kind of what I'm doing in the global rack space. Yes. Or I can talk a little bit about too uh, the keyboard rack space because it's a separate deal. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, where, wherever you want to start make is great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, y'all have a lot of keyboard players on anyway, so I don't yeah. think the world <laughs> needs to, to hear any of the stuff I'm doing, you know. Yeah, um, sure. Um, <laughs> but, okay, but uh, one thing we should bear mentioning is that you do have your keyboard tilted towards the stage so yes. people can see what you're doing, which is a ton yeah. of fun. Right, um, yeah, I had this custom printed uh, uh, 3D, bra uh, this 3D printed on, bracket that I, that I designed. Um, to perfectly match the profile of the uh, of the keyboard. Um, that's, uh -huh. that's one of the reasons I use such a, a, a cheap controller is that it's very light <laughs> and yeah. um, it supports this configuration uh, very well. And yep. if, I need, if it falls, I need to replace it. You know, it's no big deal. <laughs> yep. And I, I don't really use a lot of controls on the keyboard. Like for me, it's just something else that can go wrong. So right. I, try to, I try to avoid that where I can. So um, I, I wish that there were people making a nice, if anybody knows of any like, uh, higher end, like key, almost keyboard only controller with, with like a pitch wheel and mod wheel, you know, something very slim down, but like that's nicer. Like I don't need necessarily anything, something weighted or anything, but mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, yeah. if anybody knows of anything, I would be uh, delighted yeah. to know about it. Put it in the comments if you know, if you're into it. <laughs> right, uh, right. Yeah. So um, the way that this works is that I have some scripting going on when I change songs, when I change song parts. Um, okay. You don't have to use scripting for this, but. For, for my brain, the behavior that I wanted was not easily supported in Gig Performer because what I want is that I want, as I'm changing through, as, I, as I'm stepping through the show, um, I want my keyboards to be muted unless I actually need them. <laughs> you know, I, I don't gotcha. want, you know, we play on some small stages with like, and sometimes it's not even a stage, sometimes it's just a corner, you know, and if somebody sure. comes in like, you know, somebody drunk barrels into me right at the front of the stage, um, I don't want them to like press the keyboard and, you know, make all sorts of noise that does, shouldn't be there. So, yeah, absolutely. So anyway, the way that I have the scripting set up is that if I don't have something explicitly mapped to that song part, um, it switches to this uh, sort of global mute rack space and the keys side. But if I am using the keyboard for something, like this this song part is uh, uh, for all right now, it's a piano on the left hand and then some organ on the right. So nice. this one mutes the guitar because I don't need that anymore. And that way I don't have to fiddle with a, my volume knob or volume pedal or anything like that. So the guitar is muted. Mm -hmm. And now the keyboard over here selects the appropriate rack space. Yep. So, yep. so you're doing this, you've got GP script, but is it running, like, are you sending OSC messages or yeah. what is gig? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's using OSC. Um, uh, I don't, I don't want to dig too deep into the details of that. Um, sure. I will pr I'll probably do a write-up at some point of all this. Yeah. I know um, Namanja has been very, uh, was pretty adamant that I do that at some point. Yeah, so. yeah sure, sure. <laughs> uh, another email. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, but at, at a high level, let me see if I can at least show you the song script. Um, there's, sure. Like with most things involving code, there's many ways you can go about implementing it, a certain thing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the like the heavy lifting is done through this feature that I just discovered called uh, includes, where you can have uh, code files that live somewhere else, and um, that way all my common like per song behavior can be implemented in a completely separate file. Yes, I, I won't dig yep. too deep into that, but what what's really interesting is this part here where I have uh, a mapping of the name of the song here uh, maps to uh, a rack space on the keys side, and that's really I gotcha. think all that you need to know. Um, yep. If, yep. if I don't have anything explicitly set up, like there's no mapping for the GTR, um, then it, the script on this side knows to just go to the default rack space or the, the muted rack space. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's some high level stuff. Um, yeah. So 
if you have any questions, throw, feel free to throw them in the comments if you're wondering something specific. But um, uh, I'll continue, Jed. I just want to. Sometimes I'm like, people forget <laughs> the questions. Yeah, yeah no but, worries, no worries. We're actually here live. We're literally, actually doing this as you are viewing it on YouTube. Anyway, yep, continue. Yep, <laughs> that's a real deal. Uh, okay, so. Um, like, like I mentioned earlier, I wanted to kind of go into some of the details that I've come up with in the global rack space because I think that there are some practical tips uh, that I've discovered that Gig Performer can help me with that I was constantly running into with some of my older hardware. Um, mm -hmm. So um, one problem I had was this idea. So when I would program my songs, you know, one patch per song, uh, I would typically have the lead boost, you know, pr programmed as like a snapshot in that patch is how Helix works. Sure. Um, but what would often happen, so like, but for every patch, you know, is a separate thing, completely separate thing. So what would happen a lot of times is that the sound guy would tell me, oh, your rhythm sound is great, but I need your leads to actually come up a little bit. I, for some reason, don't have the too loud problem. I have the too quiet problem. Mm -hmm, <laughs> sure. Um, it's the rare. problem is, problem. yeah, for, for guitarists, it's very rare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so... So what uh, what I would have to do back then would have to like go through every patch and like you know go find that place where the boost happens and change the level. You know, it's very time consuming and most of the time I just dealt with it. You know, yeah. <laughs> but in Gig Performer you can have um, you can have widgets that so they map to a plugin parameter. Obviously, I can't remember exactly what this one is mapped to. It's mapped to okay. So I just have like a literally just a gain block that's yep. a little extra volume boost and it's just bypassed when I'm not soloing and um, and uh, not bypass when I am soloing. Um, so that I have the, the knob is just the level, and it's set up to ignore variations. So that way, uh, if I get to a gig and sound guy tells me, hey, you're too loud, too quiet on your leads, I turn that knob once, and then it's set for the whole show. So nice. So very, very practical yeah. thing. Um, I mean, you know, if you're running a hardware pedal board, there are solutions, you know, you just run, um, uh, you just you you uh you bend down and you turn the knob, <laughs> right? Right, right, right. <laughs> but, so this, but I assume, this, is this the last thing it hits? Like your signal is processed first, and then it hits this boost before it goes out. Is that? Uh, yeah, this? yeah. This in this case, it's just like uh, so front effects. Uh, the the main amp is here. Um, uh, like lead and or um, reverb and delay for the solo that that comes in, um, mm -hmm. and then like yeah, the boost at the very end. Gotcha. So gotcha. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. I, I've used EQ blocks or EQ pedals before too. Um, in this case, like it just kind of sounded best to do just a little bit of a, a yep. global volume boost. Yeah. So, awesome. So anyway, um, it, people might have noticed like that my guitar input's not actually here, right? Like it's not actually coming in from the interface here or yes. going out to the interface here. Like it's all. Uh, this is kind of a loop. Uh, from the global rack space. So the global rack space is where the signal chain coming from my wireless transmitter uh, to the hardware goes to the interface. And then, um, so there's some processing happening in the global rack space. And then um, just a couple of global things. And we'll go over that here in a second. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting and practical too. Yeah. Yep. Um, but then for like, for like the main core sound for whatever band, like that's all in the rack space and those and the individual variations. And then it goes back out to the global rack space for not necessarily any more processing, just uh, level management. So, gotcha. So looking gotcha. at that. Uh, okay, so let's look at the global rack space because that's really cool. Um, I'm gonna make this bigger so folks can see it. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Beautiful. So, um, we'll, we'll go in order uh, of the wiring view. So, Perfect. here's where the signal starts. So, uh, audio in. That's my. Oh yeah. Let me show my rack. Um, so this is my. Where all the hardware lives, basically, it's uh, okay. has my in ears, my my headset, um, a four channel uh, DI box, and then underneath that is my audio interface, uh, Motu M4, and yep. uh, and my guitar, my trusty Line Six G30 that's been kicking for like 12 years and still <laughs> going strong. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the back uh, has outputs for uh, my wireless mic, uh, my stereo in ears, and then this is my USB. Um, that goes out to my pedal board. So mm -hmm. I have this very long, um, if folks can see it. Yeah, I can pull you. Hold on. Let me okay. pull you up so they can see. Uh, <laughs> this, there you this, go. This very long USB 3 cable that runs mm -hmm. from uh, the back of stage and, or yeah, like the back line to the front line, and that plugs into my pedal board, which my pedal board's all just USB. That doesn't even have an, no audio signal, no uh, 
no uh, no power even. It's all powered and data through this one uh, expensive yep. USB cable. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they do so, get expensive, don't they? Yeah. So so that yeah. lets me keep my computer like on the back line uh, because right. my the, it, it ends up looking like this when I'm playing live with the the computer on top of the rack. Yep. And then so just a couple of you know two USB Type C cables, one for power, one for data, because I have a USB. Uh, hub in the back here. You can kind of see it hiding out under here. Yep, I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a hard drive in there that has all my sounds and and everything. Yep. That way, if the if the computer theoretically dies, like I don't lose much. I still need to get some other backups and stuff, though. <laughs> sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So okay. So this is this is the the hardware behind the gig performer. Right. Yeah. So. Yep. And then on my on the floor, I've got a couple of options for control. So. Uh, my keyboard controller is just a very simple Nectar Impact uh, GX61. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, it's very simple, light, and cheap. Um, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. uh, my tech. I'm not like a classically trained keyboard player, so I don't need the uh, the weighted keys or anything like mm -hmm. that. I, I get by. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is what works for me. It's just very simple. Uh, USB. Uh, this USB cable uh, and and the sustain pedal is actually on my pedal board as well, right here. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the smaller ones, but um, I had to. Uh, I made some compromises on the the expression pedal and the sustain pedal to make them fit on this uh, this uh, temple board. So yep. it, and it all fits in very snugly under my keyboard rack. Uh, this is uh, using. Hey, that's a great picture. Yeah, <laughs> using Gibraltar hardware for all that, just because it's insanely customizable. Um, yep. Uh, there's other trade-offs with it, but we won't go into that. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and then I run uh, two iPads, um, sort of hiding behind the keyboard. That's okay. what these arms are. Uh, so one, I'm using, uh, I'm running a program called Open Stage Control. Actually, it's through a web browser. Um, okay. Yep. That is sending OSC from my Gig Performer instances to um, to something that I can hook into with a web browser on an iPad and just see what I need to see. Um, yep. On you know without having to have the laptop right in front. Like that's kind of how gotcha. I solved that problem. Um, gotcha. The other the other iPad I use for like mixing my in ears and eventually some reference material. I'm still trying to. Find out a okay. good solution for that. <laughs> okay. So with the OSC, do you end up with the iPad anyway? Do you end up controlling Gig Performer and it's or it's mostly visual <laughs> reference and the controls uh, yeah, come from I, your foot pedal? I, I started. Um, here, here, here's how it looks like actually. So okay, um, because it's running in a web app, um, I can also just run you know open up Chrome here on my uh, on my computer, and yep. you can see it. Uh, I want to yep. hide the bookmark bar. That's okay. Um, so, I mean, what I see it when I'm changing stuff, let me see if I can, I'll, I'll bury it. Okay. So, sorry. Okay. No, so okay. As, as I'm stepping through the show, which I'm doing with my hardware here, um, it's updating what I need to see. Gotcha. So I'm using, uh, these are the first eight song parts, uh, just a mm -hmm. visual reference. Mm -hmm. uh, I can actually click on these two and control them. I figured out how to do that. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, my guitar tuner. Um, just turns on the tuner for from Gig Performer, okay. and uses uses OSC to actually send the tuner information uh, over the network. So fascinating. I, yeah, no, this was really cool. I was like, this that was kind of the big problem with this uh, approach. It was like, I, I need to have a guitar tuner where I can see it. I don't want to have to go back there to do it. I want to do it up here and like, right. you know, some, some I can't remember who it was on the community who uh, who clued me into this approach, but I was like, okay, mm -hmm. that's perfect. <laughs> that's all I need. Yep. And there, there is a pre-built one, too. So if you're watching mm. and you're like, oh, I wish I could tune my guitar via OSC, there's a lemur template and a touch OSC template that is built in and, and works if you're trying to experiment with that stuff. Right. Um, cool. Anyway, continue. This, so, so this is fascinating. This is called Open Stage Control, this, yeah, this yeah, web it's, app? It's, it's, it's open source. I, I would, um, so you can edit everything through the web browser. I think I can come in here and do like edit mode uh, to gotcha. like... To be able to see like the the hierarchy of all the they call them widgets I think too. Um, ah, know, it's, there it's, you go. It's been a, it's been a while since I looked at this, so um, yeah. I I forget exactly how it all works. <laughs> yeah. Which is, is totally fine. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's a that's topic for another video or blog yes, post yeah. or something. Ah, <laughs> for real. Okay. So this so. gives you the ability to see what you need to see, and yeah. if you want, you can also control what you have to control. Um, right, yeah, I've got all this open space here. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with. <laughs> uh, also, I feel like it bears mentioning, like, you're using a Morningstar pedal, which, like, by yeah. design, those are meant to be able to switch what it's sending internally. But yeah, you're not doing I, that. I'm, I'm criminally underutilizing this thing. <laughs> right, but 
but gig performer i i feel like it's i i'm like trying to drive home my own agenda slightly here so forgive me for this but if you're using gig performer having a controller that sends out different banks of ideas doesn't really matter because you can change what it's mapped to on a per rack space or per song basis so you're not going to run out of space exactly. right david is david is raising his hand <laughs> hey how's it going david hi uh, i'm sorry if i can i ask a question um are you configuring your pedal controller so that like you switch banks and that sends different no 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 like it's, it's literally just um sorry was that for me or for brett that was for you. I think that was for you. Uh, okay, okay. No, no. Like, so the pedal, I'm just. It's like uh, each each switch is sending a, a MIDI CC or something like that, and all it's that always is just... the same. You're not changing. Yeah, right. It's always the same. Yeah. One one of the things that I find we have to keep explaining to users, new users, uh, who try to still use banks, because I heard you mention banks. Oh. Right. Uh, try to use banks and put and send different messages depending on the bank, and we have to try and explain. Please don't do that. Set your buttons to just be, you push on, you get 127, you let go, you get zero. Each button has a CC and that never changes and then do everything from gig yep. four. And exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I what I was trying to achieve with some of my older setups, you know, a decade yeah, ago yeah. and was just not supported by BrainSpawn or MainStage or anything like that. Not supported very well, at least. So Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. But I, that's, I just wanted to mention that because it is a key thing uh, and it's a mistake that new users often make because they try to apply an older style mm -hmm. and like, well, I've, I've got all these banks. I might as well use them. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. same, with, same with controllers. Stay on MIDI channel one on your keyboard. Yeah. Never change it. Let gig performer handle the splitting yeah, exactly. uh, and, and so on. Okay, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. That, just kind of, that just kind of goes back to tap dancing. You know, like I don't want to have to be navigating through my pedal board uh, you know, as at the same time that like software stuff is happening. If I can do that all in software, I can back it up. It makes the show easy to operate, you know, from my feet and everything. So, so mm -hmm. no, it's, yep. it's totally, yeah, we're, we're on board there. We're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I, we're getting on, on time, man. She's already 50 minutes. Yeah. So, okay. It's I crazy, look at the right? yeah. space Cause yeah, it just yes. time flies when you're having fun. So I want to That's show right. off a couple cool things. Looking back at the wiring view for the global rack space. Well, well. Okay. So audio in. Um, the first thing it hits is a high pass filter. I think this is just like the default Apple thing, because my guitar has a piezoelectric bridge on it to let me simulate acoustic sounds. Uh, when I turn that on, though, it has a ton of of low end that just is booming and like you know it echoes through the guitar and it's just not good. But what I found yeah. was that like if I can just high pass that you know and cut it about at 96 hertz or something, um, mm -hmm. and then. When I was like comparing the mags, like or the magnetic pickups rather, the traditional pickups, um, they don't really have a lot of information in that range that I could see. So like I just leave it on all the time, and it's fine. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's common to do anyway, right? Like there's mud down there, unless you're specifically right. trying to yeah, send information in that area. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think more so on the output than the input, but sure. Um, That's true. You're right. Yeah. I, I I haven't had any issues with it so far, um, or at yep. least. If, if anybody I've ever played with has noticed an issue, then now they can tell me that that's what it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this is cool. Um, I have this uh, pitch shifter, basically. This is a, a software recreation, I visual aid, sorry, of this pedal, of the Digitech drop pedal. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's a, this is like a very common thing on pedal boards for, and cover bands now because it just lets you polyphonically change the pitch of your guitar. Um, and it sounds great, almost no latency. Um, the problem is that like it only has input and output. There's no way to right. remotely control that knob or that switch. So, kind of a bummer. Um, yeah. But I uh, like there are a couple of plugins that do polyphonic pitch shifting now, and uh, one of them is the Archetype Petrucci plugin. That's actually how I first started using it. And um, so I have an instance. Sorry, <laughs> I'm like clicking through. It's, here. it's okay. <laughs> so I have an instance of that plugin, um, and I'm only using it for uh, this transpose feature here, so gotcha. so uh, gotcha. uh, when it's off, like the whole thing is bypassed. So this is my, I, I might need to go, go to uh, something we can hear. Uh, my lead effects aren't coming in. That's okay. Um, so when I turn this on, and then turn the 
Turn the knob. So I can actually program it. You know, something like that. <laughs> so it's so fantastic. And so, like to me, and obviously, I'm not hitting the strings over here. When I hear that, I mean, I would have literally no way to know. Yeah, if I'm on a clean, like you can, eh, it it's not perfect, you know. But again, all things are trade offs. Um, this setup lets me play the same guitar every night. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. all night. I don't have to switch it uh, unless I want to. You know, I, I have a, what was I, I designed to be an identical backup, but it's, it's not. Yep. And that's what th that's what these buttons are for. Before you move on from here, can you? So the plugin name you're using is what for for the, the shift? Yeah, the plugin is the Archetype Petrucci. Oops, that's the, gotcha. um, that's my main sound. But so it's uh, it's kind of an all-in-one neural DSP plugin. Uh, it, it's what I'm using for my core guitar sounds too. I'm just using different instances. Um, gotcha. the, the way that I'm using the pitch shifting is like we have certain songs we play in different keys from the recordings or different tunings. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody else will switch guitars or retune. I press the button. <laughs> yeah. I you mean, know, and, that's, that's what it's all about, right? Like not having right. that just weight of having to do extra work on stage. Yeah. You know, and as far as like the flow of the show goes to like, you know, everybody else is retuning or, or, you know, or picking up new instruments, unplugging stuff. I can like press a button and then like fill in the gaps with some uh, something like that. I'm still sure. finding some tuning issues. Still breaking in this new guitar. Uh, yeah, so I, I need to adjust. Which you it. actually have a solution for that too. Is that in your global rack space? Yes, yes. So, um, so anyway, the the guitar pitch changes based on uh, song selection. So, some mm. of the songs have uh, song transpose turned on. Uh, I was hoping okay. we'd have more time to dig into this, but I don't think it's uh, that's okay. Well, I, mean, I would say we if we hit like one fifteen, then we're good there. So feel okay. free to okay. stress a bit. Cool. Time. Yeah. Okay. So like whole lot of loves in E, uh, but uh, Mississippi Queen we play down. So you can see actually you can see this widget doing stuff when I when yep. I switch sounds right. Mm -hmm. So it turn so it turns on, and it uh, turns the knob to the appropriate uh, pitch shift. Yeah. So, yeah. And you're all of this based on scripting. Uh, yeah, well, it's a little bit, yeah, uh, because so here's where it happens. Uh, the transpose is done in the song properties. Um, yep. That actually changes the global transpose. And then uh, on the in the global rack space, I have uh, both of these parameters uh, mapped to where I can script with them. I have to go mm -hmm. to edit mode. So they have under the widget, under advanced, they have a name that I can access yep. it in, in the scripting with. And then if I open the global rack space, it should be a uh, uh, global rack space script. Mm. Uh, it's down here. OK. So um, so I'm actually, I, I, I just discovered that uh, the, the global transpose changes when the song transpose changes. It yes, makes yeah. perfect sense in hindsight. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what I was, uh, I was actually having um, I think in the gig script file, which is the global script, where I, I can do stuff based on song changes, um, I'm sending an OSC message that grabs the transpose amount from the current song that I'm on. Gotcha. And then sends an OSC message uh, back to this instance of gig performer to, and that's what this script picks up. This script picks up that message. And then it pulls gotcha. the transpose amount out of the message and then apply it. And then it, so there's a little bit of transformation that has to happen because that transpose amount goes from minus 12 to positive 12. Um, but the widget value goes from zero to one. So, um, right, right, right. I, I have a little uh, custom function that just does the math, basically. Gotcha. We, we, we don't need to dig super deep into that because sure, sure, sure. I'm not confident that I could explain it. <laughs> and the, uh, the fair. And the other thing, too, is system actions would allow you to do some of this, which I, I don't know if you looked at that at all, but uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, right. <laughs> and, and I, so I'm, yeah, I'm sure that uh, there are ways to do it without scripting and in yeah. the same way that there are ways to do like the song switching without scripting. You know, I just had a particular need to want to have well, the keyboards muted, you know, when I don't. And have one of the, we were talking about this earlier, right? Like one of the things that is special about gig performers, it has a lot less a than mm -hmm. other software right. so if you're living in a world where you're like this really works for me most of the time gig performer is going to be like have at it friend and yep. and you know 
now we're looking at the results of that, which is really great. Yep. So yep, you Shift is responding with some scripting to the song transpose. Yes. Yeah. Right now it's doing that directly. I, I could rewrite that to where it's keying off of the global transpose instead. Right. Um, yes. But actually, like the, the OSC idea is more general because, like, <clears throat> you might have something maybe in a specific rack space that you want to change have some global rack space thing respond to. Um, yes. You know, it's, it's hard to do that directly, but with OSC, you know, sending messages back to the same instance of Gig Performer, you can do uh, anything. <laughs> right. Yes. And Which sometimes cool. And crash. you don't even think about this, do you? Like, once when you're playing and you switch to the song, it just does it. Oh, no, no, like, yeah. Like, all, all the thought is done up front when you're doing the programming. Right. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's all, you know, I, I step through the show, basically. I come through and I make a set list based on... Uh, you know, whatever the band leader sends out. Yep. And um, just arrange the songs. I have, um, you know, the master song list, obviously, for each band. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I just I just step through the show, you know, and it's it's uh, it usually goes off without a hitch. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this and this, okay, so you've got the global transpose, and then you've got, what, what else do you have going on in your global rack space? Right, right. So, so the next thing is it takes the guitar coming in and splits it um, four ways. It could be more ways, but right, I just I chose four because I have like four guitars. So yep. what I'm solving here is that okay. So I have um, this guitar, a very nice uh, Kiesel uh, Aries series. Um, I uh, it has you know a certain you know configuration that I've chosen. I have this one too. This I got I got this one first. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the green one. They're the same body wood. They're the same pickups. The same electronics. Um, only the only things that differ are like the neck wood and stuff like that. I was assuming that they would sound almost identical, and they do not. <laughs> right. yeah. um, this one, actually, for some reason, and I don't know, maybe they screwed the pickups up or something, but uh, I'm happy enough with it that I'm not going to like turn it back or any, return right, it or anything. Course. But yeah. um, you know, I've like I've tweaked all the things I can do on the hard like, and it's just like this this one outputs at like minus 14 decibels, and that one outputs at like minus six. It's a lot hotter. So. Wow. So I was like, okay, well, I, I programmed everything with that one because I had that one for a longer time. So mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking, okay, what can I do to kind of normalize my, my guitar sounds for the different guitars that I have? Yeah. And hardware, I mean, there's, again, there's always solutions. You, know, you could have a, a boost pedal that you only turn on or a guitar pedal that you only turn on when you change guitars. But then if you have like three guitars that all sound different, you, know, you can't, or you're going to have right. a, a pedal for every guitar. I mean, maybe you know, some maybe. people do. But <laughs> kind of very, that's, that's, very big pedal board. Yeah, yeah that's, that's not me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, uh, software to the rescue. Um, yeah. I have um, basically each one of these outputs it just, it just splits the guitar signal coming in. It's stereo coming out of the pitch shift, although I don't really think it's doing any stereo effects. Um, and then it goes into, uh, so there's a signal chain, a separate sort of pre-processing signal chain for each of my guitars. Um, so my, my default one, the green Kiesel, um, the one that I programmed everything with, doesn't have any processing. It just goes straight through. Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, I programmed everything with it. I don't need to make any adjustments. So that, that's mm -hmm. sort of the baseline. And then yes. from there, like, so these buttons here, so this is kind of using the radio button script idea um, yep. from the community. Uh, so this lets me pick which guitar I'm playing. So um, this is the Blue K, the Blue Kiesel. Yep. So I have a Strandberg back there and an Ibanez somewhere else that might come out to gigs sometimes. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, I pick this button. And what these buttons are doing is just turning on the, the solo switch for that mixer, for the input mixer here. So um, I didn't label them like I should have, <laughs> but um, so that's the this is the channel for the blue Kiesel. So this is only letting output three and four through this uh, yep. part of the, the signal chain. And then, mm -hmm. in order to correct the sound, here's what I did. I have a I have a plugin, an analyzer plugin from Waves, yep. that will um, just kind of give me visuals. You know, kind of gives me the, the EQ curve. It kind of gives me the, uh, the audio out, uh, the sort of the peak level. And then mm -hmm. uh, I, I did that with my baseline guitar. Um, got it set because because it'll uh, it'll stay set uh, when you when you do that. And then um, I took a screenshot and then plugged in mm -hmm. my new guitar or my my other guitar here, and then opened up this EQ block and just uh, tweaked it until uh, what I was getting in the analyzer matched the snapshot. I mean, of course, you still have to yeah. use your ears. Um, I sure. had, had to back some stuff off, but 
Um, this lets me get pretty dang close to having these two guitars enter the main signal processing chain at about the same levels and the same EQ curves. Yes. Wow. Okay. So this basically means, if I'm correct, when you switch guitars and you press the button, you're the only one who knows you switch guitars. Yeah, like no one else would audibly hear that. That's the idea. Yeah. 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 Yep. And and what benefit? So like I'm not a guitar player. What benefit do you get from having it having all of the guitars sound similar? Is it that your setup works with the different ones? <laughs> it's it's, uh, one? it's mostly just consistency. It's yeah. um you know make it looks like uh having the guitar um be louder you know it just makes the strings you know when you're playing it that that mind body physical connection you yeah. know can can actually vary pretty wildly depending on like the output level of the guitar the, the guitar um just the way that it sounds you know just it's really just mostly for consistency yeah okay. you know so. fantastic that makes a ton of sense to me yeah. So you've got a little video button thing happening, so you can only have one of the solos turned on at a time. Right. And then you've done the, the work with an EQ ahead of time so that you get the consistency that you want. Yep. Do you often switch guitars on stage? No. No. Uh, the and only reason I, mean, I would switch a guitar on stage is if I break a string or something. Right. So you usually have more than one with you. Uh, I'll, yeah, always have two. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So so this is like your, your backup here. Right, yeah. So, you know, it's... Thinking through all the the possible things that can happen on stage and trying to uh, trying to account for it. Uh, so yes. another thing that's happening. So anyway, once it gets through this part of the signal chain, then it goes to the rack spaces, to where all the like mm -hmm. the main guitar amp stuff happens, all the effects, all the all the fancy stuff that makes it sound yep. good. And then um, the rack spaces always send it back out to here, where it goes through uh, a little output mixer. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a uh, a thing where so all my guitar sounds come through in stereo. Um, right. I default to running stereo outputs. Uh, so far, I've been lucky enough to be able to run stereo guitar and stereo keyboards um, right. to all of our front of house gigs we've had. But I'm worried about a situation where I might not have that luxury. You know, smaller channels, smaller places. Um, you know, we have our own PA and mixer and everything. But if we're ever using somebody else's thing that's like only got 16 channels or something, um, you know, I might just need to run mono. So right. rather than giving them just half of my stereo signal. Um, I have the same sort of radio button idea over here, although the implementation is a little bit different, where it will uh, send this signal. Uh, it goes through a stereo. You know, that's the default. Um, yep. And since I switched it over to mono, it's muted. And it's just sort of doing a mono sum of, of everything and sending it to the first output. Yep. So I can just give, uh, have a mono sum. Um, so yep. so that's that's another idea too. A lot of like hardware modelers will have that built in. Like if you only plug in one side, it sums everything for you. But uh, a little mm -hmm. bit harder to do that in the setup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and and you know as soon as you start running it through a a stereo VST, you now have information on both sides and right. and valuable information, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like ping like <laughs> ping pong delays and stuff. I mean, like if you're only hearing half of that, like <laughs> you know, uh, right, it's, 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 it's no longer a, a ping pong. Yeah, yeah, you just ping, ping, you know. Right. <laughs> not not quite right. Ping, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so Glenn has some questions for you later oh. because he's prepared right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you are on the Facebook group or, or the I know you're on the community forum. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the community forum now, um, officially registered and everything. There I'm you on go. the uh, the Gig Performer uh, Facebook group, uh, you know, yeah. Feel free to yes. add me on Facebook, you know, if anybody yes. has any questions. Send me a you know, Facebook Messenger, that's fine too. Um, awesome. so yeah. Awesome. Did we miss anything, Jet? I've, I've we've hit so mu so much. We've gone through all uh, these things. Yeah, you know, I mean, I could give a quick demo of although well, you know, the Ottawa thing is probably not going to work right now because my my Helix plugin needs to be authorized. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Um, yes. So, so anyway, yeah. So this has been wonderful. Uh, if you, if you've been watching and you got like value from watching make sure you hit the like and subscribe button to help more people know about gig performer um but i've been asking everybody who comes on this question so i didn't let you prepare for it i have ah. to start remembering to do that but here's here's a question for you and i see actually we had a... let's actually answer this one first okay. i i maybe usually read these first before i put them on the screen let's find out i use rack spaces for my different amp settings clean rhythm lead how do i use the audio player in 
before, before when I insert it and I play a backing track and then switch rack spaces for the different parts of the song, the song stops because the player is not. Um, I think, okay, my first answer, I'm going to let you answer this, Jet, unless you don't know the answer. But my first answer is join the gig performer forums because yeah. this this is a, a very uh, accessible type of information. Um, and then my second answer is the global rack space, right? Are we, I think throw so. your audience in the global rack space. Um, yeah. David wants to hold on. Hey, David. The whole point of the global rack space is to put stuff there that needs to stay on while you're switching rack spaces. So you put exactly. your file player there, it stays on. Exactly. And, <laughs> Perfect. and you can have your parameters be controlled from the local rack space. Right. So if you're wanting to do something, something you said makes me think you're trying to step through things and you, you like can you switch tracks or something or restart them. Yeah. You just have local widgets mapped to the parameters in the global. Correct, correct. Which we have a video on that, and um, I will make sure that that gets linked um, to uh, the comments. But you can assign in the advanced tab a global parameter um, to anything that's in the global rack space, and then if there is a two system action, a two two global rack space block, you then can map those widgets to those parameters, and that will give you um, what you need. So, Jordan, that is that is the uh, the tip of the day, I guess. Um, thanks for popping in, David. Um, so this is the question, is if you had to give a new gig performer user one essential tip for getting started the right way, what would it be? Uh, keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, like, yeah. I mean, so like what you're seeing in my screen, my rack spaces and everything, like that's an evolution of like a year's worth of, of, of playing and tinkering and stuff like that. You know, like yes. um, what, you, what you saw in the more in the like the Fastlane guitar uh, thing was uh, a lot more of kind of like where it starts, you know, like yeah. I, I wouldn't start like e even not even starting with widgets, you know, like yeah. um, uh, for a guitar player, you know, find a good all in one plugin. Like there's there's a there's a bunch of them out there. Um, the neural DSP stuff, any of them, all the any of the archetype plugins, uh, Pachucci, Pliny, uh, Gojira, you know, so on and so forth. Like those are all fantastic plugins. They have everything you need in in one uh, in one plugin. Um, it's very friendly with Gig Performer to map parameters to widgets when you do want to start automating that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, guitar players specifically, we also have uh, THU included. Um, Bob Miller says thanks. Learn a ton. So thanks for yeah. checking it out, Bob. Um, and and uh, yeah, okay, um, friends, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. If you have any questions for Jet, um, let us know. Um, you can reach him through his website or through the community forums or through um, Facebook. Yep. And if you want to check out his shows, we've got links to his social media as well as to his bands in the comments so you yes. can meet him in person if you're in the Kansas City area. Um, Jet, thanks so much for popping on today. Okay. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. All right.